20% of adult men feel like they don't have a single best friend. Over half of the men that they polled said they're not currently satisfied with their friend group that they have today. The number of Google searches for where to meet good friends is up 500% since 2009. And the truth of the matter is, it's just not as easy as it used to be to find great friends. So I'm gonna give you 18 things today, I'm gonna to talk about this, of things you can do to help you just as an adult meet more friends. Hello and welcome to another episode of Real Man Real Conversations. And today on the podcast, I wanna talk about 18 things you can do to help you meet more friends as an adult. My entire program, We Are The They, is designed to help men with this very thing, right? We live in a society today, we know that it's more difficult than ever for men to connect on a deep level. I just spoke at uh, Erwin McManus's event at the arena out in LA last weekend, and I spoke to this very topic, and there was a couple as I was researching for this, 20% of adult men feel like they don't have a single best friend. Over half of the men that they polled said they're not currently satisfied with their friend group that they have today. And uh, the shocking part about that 20% number is that in 1991, that number was 3%. Like, think about that for a minute. The numbers are in six times as many people feel like they don't have a best friend as they did in 1991. Another kind of crazy stat is that the number of Google searches for where to meet good friends is up 500% since 2009. And the truth of the matter is, it's just not as easy as it used to be to find great friends. So I'm gonna give you 18 things today, I'm gonna to talk about this, of things you can do to help you just as an adult meet more friends. And everybody should have some best friends to do life with. Like the bottom line is, is life is just better when you're doing it with other people, right? Every single experience in your life is heightened when you get to experience it with people that you love, whether that's a romantic relationship or friendship. But ultimately there's things that, you, you know, ultimately one of the main reasons that guys should have close friends is when things are going wrong or you know you, you need someone to talk to, you can't go to your wife. She needs you to be the rock. Your, your spouse needs you to be the leader of that family. But you do need to talk about it. You need to get it out. You need to be able to express it. That's where friends come in. You go to your friends. You can you know bitch and moan about whatever's going on. You cry about things, whatever it is. You, you let them know where you're weak. They say, hey, man, I've got you. I'm not going to let you fall here. But also, while we're here, uh, let me just tell you, like you're going to go home and be a rock for your family. And that's what that looks like. That's why friendships are so important. So within We Are The They, it's probably the most important part of the entire program. So I wanna talk about these 18 things today. And each one of these, I'm breaking down to give you a little bit more perspective on why this helps you to connect and meet more friends as an adult. So number one is give more compliments, more sincere compliments. I don't know why people think there's like a limited number of compliments that you can give. Like when you walk into a room, if your buddy's wearing something that looks good or he's sharp or got a new haircut or maybe he's got a good beard going, whatever it might be, give him a compliment on it, right? When your friends accomplish something cool, hype them up, talk them up, be very sincere about it. Um, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that when you're giving these compliments too is like do it not expecting to get anything in return. People remember a sincere compliment almost more than anything. My mentor, Ed Milet, he's so good at this. He does this thing where he's called, let me tell you about you. And I've talked about this many times before, but he'll basically just start pouring into you about something you know about yourself to be true, but it just feels good to say it. Every time I do this to somebody, you can see him start to smile. You see him start to light up. So everywhere you go, tell people about themselves. Tell them why you're impressed by them. Tell them what you love and admire about them. I was doing a podcast earlier today with a guest and I just told him straight up, I said, here's three or four things that I learned about you, man. And I watched you when the cameras were off, when nobody was looking, he's a famous athlete. And I said, I said, dude, that was the day I knew I was gonna be a fan of yours because nobody else was there but me. Nobody else could see what was going on. And you were just so humble and so sincere and, and, and that really mattered a lot to me. And you could see him kind of start beaming a little bit as I gave him that compliment. Also with, you know, the women in your life, like give more compliments. Now, if it's your buddy's wife or some random stranger or whatever else, you don't ever sexualize the comments. This is the easiest way I can say that. Talk about anything besides their physical appearance. For guys, they actually love to hear about their physical appearance. Anytime I notice that a guy's lost some weight, I try to point it out. I try to mention it because it's hard. It's hard to lose 20, 30, 40 pounds sometimes, and you want people to notice. So number two is try to talk about stuff that you both have a mutual interest in. Okay. Um, a lot of times people just want to talk about work, like try to move away from work. Uh, you know, I used to be roommates with Kyle Van Noy when he was playing at uh, BYU as a linebacker. He plays for the Ravens right now. And he told me one time, he said, dude, I love hanging out with you because you're the only guy that doesn't try to talk to me about football. Because I knew this principle. I knew that this guy is getting asked about football all day, all night. So we would talk about anything besides football. 
But also you want to ask a lot of questions that have to do with why as opposed to what, for example, or like how. It's like you don't want to get into the details and the logic so much as like why is this important? Why are you doing that? If somebody says, that, you know, yeah, I want to go on a trip to Scotland. Oh, hey, why do you want to go on that trip? And all of a sudden they get a story and start, well, when I was a kid, boom, 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 right? Or like, well, I've always been a big golf fan and they have these courses or whatever. Like you want to get into the why. It's just a lot deeper than the what. So number three is you got to learn to laugh a lot, okay? And uh, if you can't laugh at yourself, you're going to have a hard time connecting with other men. One of my favorite things, and when I learned, I learned this doing stand-up comedy because when I got up and got on the stage, if I could make fun of myself first, if I could laugh at myself first, then I had open game to make fun of anybody else I wanted. But if I just got up and started ripping on other people, well, then nobody was going to like me or cheer for me. And so... You know, you want to be genuine whenever you're laughing, but you want to be liberal with it. So as a comedian, another thing that we would do is because you're in the comedy club and you know that the other comedians need laughs as well, you're constantly trying to laugh as loud as you can. Like I have some guys in the program, this guy named Blaine, uh, you know, he just has the world's greatest laugh and it's so contagious and everybody wants to be around this guy. But like when people are funny, laugh, laugh out loud, make sure you demand man, that's pretty funny. Like this guy's really funny. And make sure you're edifying your friends with each other, right? Always trying to make each other look good. Always laughing with each other, not at each other. If your buddy makes a mistake, you back him up. You don't laugh at him. But then you laugh with him later on. So number four is you want to stand square and make eye contact. It's one of those things that's going to instantly give you confidence. It's going to instantly give you trust with the people that you're with. And it's important also to just take up space. If you ever watch famous people, like when they're being interviewed, um, you know, actors in Hollywood and stuff are really good at this. They're moving their hands a lot. They're taking up a lot of space because you're showing that you have an aura. You have a presence in this room. That's part of that standing score. Jordan Peterson talks about this in his book, right? Like stand with your shoulder square, like stand up, like take up some space a little bit. Number five is one of my ones that I think is really important, but to let people off the hook on your name. So what I mean by this is like every now and then people aren't going to remember your name, right? This is just a natural thing that happens. And the, what an egocentric person, centric person is going to do is they're going to go up to you and be like, dude, you don't remember my name? Like, like if you're like, hey, man, my name's Jimmy. And, and they're like, dude, we've met before. Like, what the hell? Like, and they just make you feel stupid, right? And you immediately have this disconnect with that person. Like in my life, I have like just between my close friends, family, and people that are in my program and their wives, I probably have close to 2,000 people whose names I'm trying to remember at any given time. It's a lot of people. So think about that. Like, so if I've met you before, but maybe I don't remember you. So what I tell people is, is when you go up to people, let them off the hook. So I, I'll give you an example. I, uh, I ran into Brendan Burchard last weekend when I was speaking at this event in LA. He was one of the other speakers. Brendan is one of the biggest coaches speakers on the planet, okay? This guy got offered $4 million for one speech in, in, in uh, Abu Dhabi or uh, Dubai or something. Um, he, he's coached Oprah. Like, this is the guy, right? His uh, number one coach on um, high performance. And I'm walking into the restaurant. There was a restaurant for the speakers the night before the event. So I'm walking in as he's walking in. I said, hey, Brendan, great to see you, man. And, uh, and I could tell there was just a slight hint he didn't remember me. I've met Brendan three or four times. I went to one of his events in Miami before. What an egocentric person would do here is they would be like, oh, dude, you don't remember me? Like, I, yeah, you know, we met at this thing or whatever. And so what I did instead, I said, hey, Brendan, great to see you, man. Jimmy Rex, you might remember me. I, we, we did that yacht thing in Miami. And he's like, oh, my gosh, yeah, of course. And then he even came back and he goes, dude, your book came out, uh, B1, right? And I was like, yeah. And we ended up getting sat by each other. Irwin sat us by each other at this event. I got talking with him and I said, dude, it's really cool that you remember the name of my book. And he said, anytime I'm going to an event and there's other speakers, I try to always get their names, their books. Like I want to pay attention to what's going on. So he had done some research, but it was really cool. So I let him off the hook. So anytime I'm introducing myself to somebody and they might not remember me, I always say, hey man, it's Jimmy Rex. We met at blah, blah, blah. Or hey, Jimmy Rex, you might know me from, or hey, I'm so-and-so's buddy. We met once before, but... Um, just letting them off the hook right off the bat. I remember I was at a golf course one time. This was about a year ago. And if I'm being honest, this, this dude, I can just tell you just in his ego. and He's kind of a punk. But I just go up and I'm just saying hi to a couple of people. My buddy introduced me to a couple of people. He says, hey, do you, know, do you guys know each other? I said, I don't think so. My name's Jimmy. And he literally looks at me and he goes, bro, we've met four times. And I kind of just wasn't in the mood that day. Like I was just kind of bugged that he was trying to call me out, trying to make me feel bad and have this weird interaction. Like he, we could have done what me and Brendan did, which was like end up having a really cool conversation and now we'll forever remember each other. But this dude tried to make me feel dumb. And so I just looked at him and said, you know what, dude, I, I don't know what to tell you. People don't forget my name, okay? 
And granted, it was kind of a cocky answer or whatever else, but like I was kind of just wanted him to understand the principle. Like, dude, this ain't on me. I have thousands of people I'm trying to remember. And if it mattered to you or me, we would have remembered each other. How many times have you ever reached out? Like, I've never seen you once comment on anything or call me or text me or anything. It's like, not like we're homies. I met you probably at a party with, I met 40 new people that night. I'm not going to remember your name. So just don't be the person. It's a very ego, prideful thing to do to try to call somebody out for not knowing your name and just let them off the hook. Also, another little side note on this. When I run into people, because people come up to me at the gym or just out at a restaurant or whatever, I always say good to see you instead of nice to meet you. So by saying good to see you, there's one thing I've learned. That doesn't mean anything, right? Like it could mean I, I remember you, I don't know you, or, like, or whatever else. But I just say good to see you. Get in the habit of saying good to see you as opposed to nice to meet you. So number six is people will always remember the way you make them feel. Like the bottom line is, you know, we all have these moments in life when we've been uncomfortable or something was happening and, and somebody made us feel comfortable. I remember for me, I got two of my best buddies to this day, Dan Swiss and Alan Malai. These are shout out to Alan. It's his birthday today, by the way. But these two dudes, I remember when I went to Lake Powell, it was in 2010. I just broke off an engagement and I was pretty nervous. I didn't know anybody. I was trying to make friends. I'll never forget. Those were the first two guys that just greeted me, made me feel comfortable, made me feel at home. And I've returned that favor a hundred times to them at different events and, and things that they're both in my, in my program. Like they're just amazing humans and friends. We've been friends for 15 years now, but they made me so comfortable. I remember my, my uh, best friend and, and he's down the hall right now, my assistant, Chris, um, one that kind of runs on my back end of everything. He, uh, I remember when we were in eighth grade and we were at a school dance and I just felt super uncomfortable. I remember him coming up and just being my friend and putting his arm around me and being my wingman and just taking me around and I made me comfortable in this moment of discomfort. I mean, it's been 30 years since that moment and I still remember it like it was yesterday and it really helped solidify that relationship. So go out of your way to find the people that look a little uncomfortable and just make them comfortable. Just talk to them, just introduce yourself, just make them feel at home. It's a really, really quick way to make friends. Number seven, and this is an important one too, is you can't outsource building a relationship. You know, rich people get in trouble because there's three things in life that you can't buy. And when you try, you get in deep shit. Number one is a healthy body. Number two is a mind that's at peace. And number three are loving relationships. You can't buy them. You got to build them. You, you can't shortcut it. You got to put the time in, right? It's why they're the three most actual valuable things in the society today. I'm going to say that again, the three most valuable things in society, because you can't buy them, you have to earn them from hard work and by putting in the time, is a mind that's at peace, a healthy body, and loving relationships and friendships. So when you think about that for a second, where are you putting your time? How much time have you put in with your family? How much time are you putting in with your friends, right? Like how much time are you putting in with your kids? And the truth is, is we have to find time for those things. We have to be able to do that because you can't outsource that. You can't outsource building a true friendship. Either you showed up or you didn't. Either you were there or you didn't. Either you picked up the phone or you didn't. Either you put in the time and effort or you didn't. And so don't try to outsource this. You can't, I mean, you can do things to like, you know, cheat the system a little bit. Like one of the things I did as a real estate agent is I would throw in a monthly event. I still do this. And I invite all my clients. I'm renting out Hee Haw Farms next week. We're going to have pumpkins and hay rides and all that fun stuff. But the point of this is anytime you're doing things like that, I was able to invite 500 to 700 people at a time would show up to my event. And so all of a sudden I can meet a lot more people in person. I can see a lot more people, but I'm not getting deep connecting time, but at least I'm staying in touch. Beyond that though, you have to put in the time. You have to do that. So number eight is learn how to be a good storyteller. Since the beginning of civilization, the people that could tell the best stories won, right? There's a African proverb that's like, until lions begin to talk, the hunter will always be the hero in the story or something like that. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is whoever can tell the best story is going to win. If you look at from, again, from the earliest tribe days, the person that could gather attention, that could keep people, you know, attentive was the person that had the most control in that village. And it's the same way today. Think about when you go to a party, do you run around trying to talk to everybody or do you kind of just build a fire and let people come get warm? And what I mean by that is just start talking about being interesting, start talking about interesting things and let people kind of come and be in your world. So the best storyteller is going to win over the world, or excuse me, win over the room. It's a really great way to engage other people. Also, you want to be the observed, not the observer. I'm going to say that again, you want to be the observed, not the observer. 
You want to be a great listener as well. That goes hand in hand with being a great storyteller. But it's also just knowing like how to tell a story that doesn't get too long. You guys ever seen the Office episode when Michael finally has a good story that everybody wants to hear and he's just going into way too many details. He's like, so we entered the building and we went in the turnaround thing. <laughs> he just like keeps going. Everybody's getting super pissed at him. That's how not to tell a story. But you want your stories to be funny, provocative, and to have some kind of meaning to them. Okay. Um, cut out unnecessary details. Guys in general like to be more logical. Women like to be emotional. So if you're telling a story to women, you want to try to evoke more emotion, get them excited, get them scared, get them on the edge of their seat. If you're telling stories to guys, they do like the details, but you can get bogged down in the details and forget to have, you know, the important parts of the story. I always think about stand-up comedy. You have about seven seconds between jokes or else you're going to lose your audience. So you want to only say things that are super pertinent in that time. Um, and then you want to, you know, if, if people are hearing your story and if it's a story of success or just of triumph or something like that, you want people to ask, like, could I do the same thing with my life? How does this story relate to me? And just kind of be thinking about those things anytime you're speaking or telling a story. Number nine, um, I learned this one from a close friend of mine. Um, she told me once, she said, if you want people to be interested, you have to be interesting. So when I first started, you know, this idea that maybe I wanted to try to build my social media profile, I saw because of this friend, she was making literally multiple six, seven figures doing Instagram. Um, now she has almost 25 million followers on her um, total on her channels between TikTok and Instagram and everything else. She's huge. And I asked her how she was doing it. And she said, Jimmy, if you want people to be interested, you got to be interesting. You know, I had a talk with one of my guys recently and, and he was kind of bummed. He's been in the program, you know, six months and he hadn't made close friends yet. He was like, I don't know, dude. Like, it doesn't seem like people want to invite me to stuff. And I said, well, dude, what are you doing that's interesting? Like, I've seen you at some events and you just sit there. You don't talk to anyone. You don't ask them about them. You don't get interested in them. Everybody's favorite topic is themselves, you guys. If you want people to be interested, be interesting and talk about people even. Just tell about them. Get them talking about themselves. But you've got to put yourself out there and do that. Otherwise, people aren't going to invite you. What are you adding to it? Like, are you a good friend to have around, right? Number 10 is be generous always. Okay. Um, everybody knows about the hundred dollar dinner club that we do. There's an, I have a whole episode on real men, real conversations. You want to go back and listen to it. But the bottom line is, is people like being around other generous people. I'm going to tell you a quick story because this actually cost me a lot of money one time. So I always, anytime I'd go to lunch, I'd always offer, and this is my rule today is that I'll always offer, but if other people wants to buy, I'll let them. And it's kind of like be a gracious receiver as well. And I remember I went to lunch with a guy once. I looked up to him quite a bit. He was a networker. And so he was always going to lunch, I mean, probably two a day. And he told me, he said, I don't buy lunch. It just adds up and gets too expensive. I just have people buy their own. And I looked up to this guy. So I started listening to that advice. And I remember for, a, I probably only did it five or six times. Um, I just told the person to buy their own lunch. And I remember I went to lunch with a guy and he's actually in my fantasy football league. This guy's worth multiple eight figures. Just an incredible human. He had to move to, you know, one of the guys I had to like move to Puerto Rico for a time to, to you know, take care of tax stuff and he's making so much money. And I was selling him his house. I sold him his house when he bought it. Found him the best deal. It was a short sell that we negotiated, got him into it like 150 grand below asking. Like just a crazy deal at the time. This is 15 years ago. And, uh, and then he went to sell it a couple of years later and I'd even lived with him for a while and he didn't use me as the realtor. And I was pretty butthurt. I was pretty bummed about it. And I said, dude, what, can I just ask you like, why? He said, you know, Jimmy, if I'm being honest, like I was really bothered. Like we went to lunch one time and you told me that I needed to pay for myself. And I remember I only did it because of the stupid advice I got from this other guy that was just cheap, it turns out. And uh, it ended up costing me about an $18,000 commission that day. I mean, think about that for a second, right? Like I saved five lunches by being cheap and it cost me an $18,000 commission that would have been guaranteed to get in the house, would have sold in an hour. So the point of that story is like the problem with being cheap is no matter what, you're still just cheap. I'll tell you one other quick story. I, I went to breakfast with a guy. This is, again, probably 15 years ago. He was trying to recruit me to build a business with him. He wanted me to be his partner. He wanted to go into business together. And this guy was successful. He'd done a lot of cool things. And I remember we went to Mimi's Cafe, and we had this cute little server. She did such a good job, just an incredible job as a server. We were some of the only people there, so she's not making much money that day. And uh, he's like, no, Jimmy, I want to pay for it. I, I, you know, I offered you to come to breakfast. So he pays the bill, whatever. He goes to the bathroom. And I remember I'm like, I kind of want to just see what he left for a tip. So I just peeked. And it's about a $30 meal. And this guy left like, I remember it was like $2.50. It was definitely under $3. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. 
this waitress was working her ass off, doing a great job, and this guy was cheap. And I remember thinking to myself, he will never give me the benefit of the doubt as a partner. He will never be over generous with me as a partner if he's leaving a tip for $2.50. And it was the only reason I didn't go into business with him. This guy just spent an hour trying to sell me on why he'd be a good partner, and he lost it all by being cheap in one second. So my point is, again, like, yeah, you can be cheap, but guys, being generous always pays off. It always comes back in abundance. So find opportunities, like, to be generous. I always tell people, it should hurt a little bit or you're probably not giving enough money away. I'm going to say that again. Like, if it's not hurting at least a little bit, you're probably not giving enough money away. Okay? Number 11 is we are judged by the company we keep. I've done an entire podcast on this, but... You know, I one of the knocks that people come at me for online, it's one of the most, there's basically two or three things people try to come at me for. Uh, and two of them have to do with the company you keep. I was um, a speaker at an event called AlphaCon. And this was an event that I was just asked to speak at a business conference, said yes. Back then I said yes to almost every speaking opportunity I could. I still think that's a good idea for the most part. But it ended up being like 12 white guys on a poster for AlphaCon. I didn't even know that was what it was going to be called. So I ended up speaking at this event. My speech, actually, I'm very proud of it. I had members of We Are That they joined because they felt like I was the one heartfelt speaker at that conference, other things. But you look back on it and it looked terrible. And some of the guys I was hanging out with, some of the guys that spoke at that event, for example, um, you know, I, I was really close friends with some guys that ended up having a lot of fraud in their life. There's four or five of them, you know? And I have to be honest about that. Like, yeah, I, I guess I was trying to climb the social ladder and I was trying to go for status. And I overlooked that people were associating me with these people I was hanging out with. And later on, you know, guys like Trevor Milton and Aaron Wagner, some of these guys where the story came out and I saw the fraud and these other things that were happening, I distanced myself from them. And, you know, as soon as I could, I was, you know, quicker than most people did. But also, yeah, there's some truth to it. I, I am judged because of the company that I used to keep. And I have to own that. And so it is very important. People are going to make decisions based on who they see you with. Uh, you see this with any time a story comes out with like P. Diddy is the famous one right now or Jeffrey Epstein, some of these stories. And you see Trump, you know, pictures with Epstein. How many times have they tried to use that photo or, or him, that conversation he had with him to like prove that Trump was also a pedophile or, you know, some of these other people. And, and maybe a lot of them were, who knows what was actually going on. But at the end of the day, you're going to be associated like LeBron. Good luck. I will never look at him the same way. I don't know if he's guilty or innocent or whatever else. All I know is every time I look at LeBron, all I can think about is him saying, ain't no party like a ditty party. And that dude, you can't tell me he wasn't involved in that. And so we are judged by the company that we keep. So number 12 is don't make an enemy out of a friend. Uh, I always say, just don't burn a bridge if you don't have to, right? Like, um, yes, distance yourself from people, but you don't have to burn the bridge. You can, there's a famous saying, it's like, I still, if we used to be friends and, and we had a falling out, I still want you to eat, just not at my table. And I think that's the best way to say that. You don't have to bury people. You don't have to wish ill upon people. Um, you just, you know, have a strong boundary. And that's number 13 is having strong boundaries. If you want to improve the quality of the people in your life, you got to set boundaries with yourself. You got to be willing to set boundaries that you don't cross. Things that, you know, to you is a deal breaker. If certain people, if they lie still or cheat, that's a deal breaker for me. Like that's just one of those things. Like I can't deal with people lying to me or people stealing from me or people that are cheating on stuff because the energy of that is such a low frequency. But just what are your boundaries, right? And boundaries are just a way to love you and the person you're holding a boundary with, okay? Number 14 is you should throw at least one party or event per year. I'm adamant about this. I tell my guys, I said, you guys need to do this. It doesn't have to be expensive. The other night, we all went roller skating in our costumes. One of the guys in group number four, Alec, decided to rent out the ice skating rink or the rollerblading rink, link, rink, whatever it is. And we had a blast. We had like 30, 40 people show up and just had a really fun time. We played laser tag, had pizza, rollerbladed, and just had a really fun time. And I was just gave him props. I'm like, dude, yes, like throw a party. You learn the host always gets the most. You can remember that first. But by doing that, you're putting yourself into an uncomfortable situation and things are going to go wrong. I can't tell you every event I've ever thrown, something goes wrong. I remember one year I was doing my firework event. We got 10,000 people there. We have like 20 giant bounce houses. This guy was doing obstacle course races, kind of like, like the Spartan races and things like that, but with giant inflatables. We're talking 50 by 100 foot inflatables, like giant inflatables, 100 by 100 foot inflatables. I remember the one, they all started like caving into the middle. All these kids were... I was like, uh, they're going to get trapped in there. And we like start just jump in and start throwing kids out and stuff. 
Things go wrong. I had another year where the same inflatables, the generator went out and they all start coming down. Some old kids are still on them. You're just like, oh my gosh. But like things go wrong, you have to work through it. And like one of the most attractive things you can do as a man is to be a problem solver. Like that is one of the most important things, both for men and women to be attracted to you is be a solutions oriented person. Be a kind of guy that like, Jimmy's in charge. He'll figure it out. You know, like, oh good. We got so-and-so in charge of it. I don't have to worry about it. Like that's such a good feeling for other people to know that you are a problem solver and you can figure shit out. And by hosting parties, traveling, these are the ways that you learn to be a great problem solver, okay? Taking on challenges, things like that. Number 15, speaking of taking on challenges, is do things that make you uncomfortable. Do things that make you uncomfortable, man. Like, they always make the best stories later as well. Like, you know, you always have stuff speaking about, like, being interesting, like, fun conversations, like in this program, the guys will do more stuff in two years and we are the they than they would do in the previous 40 usually or 30. And the truth is, is we just do things that make you a little uncomfortable. And I can't tell you how many times we've done stuff and guys are like, I will never do that again. And then other guys are like, dude, I would have never done that. That was one of the funnest things I've ever done in my life. Right. We just did a thing the other day where they had to rescue these hostages from uh, some Navy SEAL guys and they were using um, pellet guns. One of the dudes took one in the face. He didn't have a, the mask on and chipped his tooth. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm so devastated. I'm like, dude. And he's like, no, man, this is the best story ever. And he just was loving it. His kids are loving it. They're like, my dad, you're not gonna believe what my dad did. You know, one of my other members, Kurt Antonino, he told me recently that, you know, people are always like, you've got to check out his Instagram. He's always doing the craziest stuff with this group he's a part of. Like that stuff matters, you know, make yourself uncomfortable, do cool things. It gives you great stories and conversations for later. Number 16 is practice public speaking as often as you can. That's what I was talking about going back to AlphaCon is, you know, I mean, I, I'll speak 30 times a year. Maybe half of those I get paid for it. The other half I'm doing it because I want to get better at it. I want to learn. I want to, you know, improve. I want to practice doing that. I want to meet more people. And so um, public speaking is a great way to do that. One of the challenges I give my guys is to go do some stand-up comedy, right? I encourage every single one of them to get out of their comfort zone and to go do something like stand-up comedy. And just bomb. Like, it's so good to buy. Have you guys ever seen the movie Fight Club, right? He makes them all go out and get in a fight, but the one rule is they have to lose the fight. It's freaking hilarious. And it's kind of like that. Like, go do something you know you're going to fail at, and you're going to be a better person because of it. Number 17 is, guys, it's 2024. Every single one of us is our own brand, okay? So ask yourself a couple questions. How can I make my brand, me, more sexy? If I was an actual company, what would I do to try to improve my brand? Like, what do you need to do on yourself? Do you need to work on your grooming? Do you need to work on your, your, your dress? Do you need to work on uh, just your physical appearance, your weight? Like, what is it? What do you need to improve upon to become a more attractive human? Because guys want to be around other guys that are doing badass things, right? I watched a video this morning with the guy that does the Comedy Central um, daily show thing, not John Stewart, the other guy. Anyway, the dude from South Africa. And he was talking about his mom when he was a kid, he went to college. And his mom was so proud of him. She's like, I'm so glad you're going. She goes, Mom, I don't actually go to classes. I can't afford that. I just go to hang out with my friends. She goes, I know. But you're surrounding yourself with other great people. And when you do that, you can't help but be elevated. And so I'm proud of you for going and spending time with these right people. I was like, man, that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing to say. So, and then this number 18, guys, the last one is, I already said it a little bit, but try something that you're most likely going to fail at. Going back to my Fight Club example, like failing is okay. Nobody cares that you fail. Like, think about it. Abraham Lincoln, I think, lost office, running for office like 11 times before he got it. I just interviewed Tony Finau on my podcast. He was trying to qualify for the PGA Tour. He failed his first six years. It wasn't until his seventh try. Most of the guys either get exempted into it from the beginning or they get it in their first shot. It took this guy seven tries to even make the PGA Tour. Now he's one of the top 10 golfers on the planet. It was really cool. So you need to, you know, quit being afraid of failing. One of the gifts of my life is that when I was younger, I did these different businesses. I had my TV show, and by all means, it was a failure. I did my meat company. The guys, you know, my partner stole my money. By all means, it was a failure. I bought all this real estate, and a lot of it ended up losing money on. By all means, it was a failure. But I had the coolest gift because everybody in my life kept coming up to me and telling me how cool it was that I was doing these different things. I can't believe you started your own business. I can't believe you started your own TV show. I can't believe you already owned 10 houses, like all these different things. And I saw that nobody cared that I was failing. They didn't see it that way. We're so hard on ourselves. We think when we're doing something, it's a failure. But everyone else just appreciated that I was putting myself out there, that I was trying these cool things. And I was getting so much experience and so much knowledge from doing this, so many relationships and friendships. And so that was really the gift of my life. I was not afraid to fail anymore. 
And one of the guys in my group said to me the other day, he said, Jimmy, I love how unattached you are to the outcome to any of your ideas. Most people aren't like that. And the truth is, I don't care. If I fail, I'll just do it differently the next time. So not being afraid to fail. This will help you endear you to a lot of friends. Because by the way, nobody wants to be friends with a guy that wins at everything anyway. Nobody wants to be friends with a guy that's the smartest in the room, the richest in the room, the best looking in the room, the funniest in the room. Like people care about one thing. I'll end it with this. People don't care about all those things, guys. All they care about is how you make them feel when you're with them. And if you're making them feel alive, that aliveness is one of the four qualities that every single person is dying for, aliveness. So how alive are you? How alive are you in your soul? How alive are you making other people feel when they're with you? Appreciate you guys. If you're interested in finding out more about friendship or gaining your own group of amazing friends, check out We Are The Day. This is our program. Our leadership program is now open. Our, uh, our tribe is open, an application process. But come find out why 500 other men have taken the jump and been a part of this exclusive group and why these friendships are so deep. I posted a video on my YouTube, if you want to go deeper in this, with a guy named Matt Beret. And uh, he spoke at our last event. He talked about his friendships that are formed through We Are The Day. It's one of the most beautiful videos I've ever shared. Go give it a listen. It's about a 30-minute video. He talks about the friendships he made. He never had close friends his entire life. He joined this group, and now he has lifelong best friends that love him more than he's ever felt in his entire life. And I could show 200 examples of guys that have that same story from We Are The Day. So thank you for listening. Please share this with your friends. Please give us a rating and uh, a review. And it helps us to, uh, you know, just get more people to listen to these episodes. Until then, go be a good friend. Take care.